Thank you, Seth. It's good to plan ahead. So, well, we are in the book of First Timothy. We what started our series in it uh, three weeks ago, two weeks ago. So we're in our third lesson this morning, and we're going to look at the rest of chapter twelve, verses uh, the rest of chapter one, verses twelve through verse twenty. So turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul has given Timothy a commission, um, instruction. He's in Ephesus. He's told him to, um, in verse 3, instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. And that was no easy task for Timothy. He was a timid young man, as uh, most Bible students have come to understand, and so he needs some encouragement, and that's what Paul gives him in our passage, beginning with verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, so they will be taught not to blaspheme. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in prayer. One of the most familiar sounds of war is men yelling, shouting a war cry. Union soldiers describe the rebel yell as blood curdling. Before that, Texans shouted, remember the Alamo. But it's ancient. In Homer's Iliad, one of the Greek warriors was Diomedes of the loud war cry. It was done to intimidate and to motivate. Even in Isaiah 42, the Lord is described in this way. He will rouse his zeal like a man of war. He will utter a shout. Yes, he will raise a war cry. He will prevail against his enemies. I mention this because war is the subject of the last half of 1 Timothy chapter 1, spiritual war. Paul tells Timothy, fight the good fight. That almost sounds like a battle cry. But Paul has a very different way of rousing Timothy for the fight. It's not through shouts and slogans that get the adrenaline moving. It's by words of amazing grace. Paul speaks of it as being more than abundant and that it saved even him, the chief of sinners. This passage is described as a digression in verse 11, Paul said that God entrusted him with the gospel, and that prompted a response of amazement from the apostle in verses 12 through 17. And it is a response of wonder, but it's not some spontaneous digression. It is a necessary part of his purpose in the book, and specifically here in the first chapter. Paul told Timothy to correct false teachers in the church. 
That was a, a challenging assignment for him. As we've noted, Timothy is known for being timid. And those men probably weren't. They were probably very confident and influential if it's true that they were some of the elders of the church. So Paul tells his story to Timothy of God's love for him and the Lord's faithful and abundant supply to him of grace. This is a necessary point in the chapter for Timothy and for his encouragement. I don't know what it's like on a battlefield, but in the Christian life, nothing rouses us to service joyfully like the love of God, because it is for all of us. Paul's story of grace is your story, my story. It was Timothy's story, and as one considers it, considers the love of God, the grace of God, it has an effect on us. If you look at your life and feel that your devotion to the Lord is not what it should be, your service to God's people is not what it should be, the solution is here. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 1, in recalling the immeasurable love of God for you. Paul was amazed that the Lord would entrust to him what he calls in verse 11, the glorious gospel of the blessed God. That didn't ignite a digression, but it did amaze him and introduced his encouragement for Timothy. Verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. The words uh, or participles strengthened and appointed like the verb considered are past tense indicating that Paul is referring to his conversion. In spite of all of the violence and the sorrow that he brought to the church as a persecutor, Christ judged him faithful and appointed him to service, putting him in the ministry. He does that for every believer. When you're called to faith, you are equipped for service and given a gift to be used in the Lord's service and for His people. There are all kinds of gifts that the Lord gives, utterance gifts and non-utterance gifts, speaking gifts and service gifts, and everyone has at least one to be used. Every one of us. Paul counted that an unimaginable privilege. After all he had done, Christ considered me faithful, he said. Now that doesn't mean that Christ saw potential in Paul as an apostle, and so he appointed him to be one, but that he saw what his grace would make Paul to be. There is nothing in Paul that called forth God's grace. That's clear from verse 13 where Paul recounts his previous life, which is what makes his conversion so amazing, amazing to him, amazing to us. Formerly, he said, I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. Yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly. Paul's career as a Pharisee and persecutor is recounted by Luke and by Paul in the books of Acts and Galatians. He persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. He imprisoned he beat, he killed Christians, he said. Acts 26, verse 11. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme, and being furiously enraged at them, I pursued them even to foreign cities. And that is where heaven found him. In the midst of his furious per persecution, on his way to Damascus to destroy the church, Christ appeared to him and called him to himself. If there's anything mitigating about his terrible persecution of the church, it was that he did it in ignorance. I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly. Paul didn't mean his ignorance merited mercy. But in the Old Testament, in the law, 
a distinction is made between sinning ignorantly and sinning presumptuously or with a high hand. There is no atonement for sinning presumptuously, no uh, sacrifice to be offered for those that sinned willfully against their better knowledge and conviction. But Paul did not sin in that way, which is different from the priests and Pharisees and the Jews in the Gospels. They sinned against the light. They sinned against their better convictions. They saw miracles. They heard teaching from our Lord. They witnessed fulfillment of prophecy and saw in Him the work of the Holy Spirit. They saw it all very clearly after a three-year period of ministry, and they rejected it completely and rejected Him. John 12, verse 37, But though He had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in Him. And they were without excuse. Paul had not sinned in that way. He had not sinned against his convictions and against the Holy Spirit in a, a willful act against his better knowledge. He thought that he was serving God. He was zealous for the Lord in what he was doing. In Acts 3 and verse 17, Peter said, Now, brethren, I know you acted in ignorance, therefore repent. It, it reflects Jesus' statement on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. But this doesn't weaken the sense of grace at all or make it conditional. Paul makes that plain in verse 14. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ. The grace of God was more than abundant. It superabounded. That's the idea. It overflowed. And that was necessary for the change that it brought about in the Apostle Paul as great a sinner and guilty a person as he was. <clears throat> it had that effect, though. It changed Paul. Grace brought with it faith and love, which Paul said are in Christ, meaning that they are both, uh, both of those are gifts of God produced by God in Him. They're produced by the Lord. <clears throat> Grace, we could put it this way, is the root, faith and love, the fruit. It's all the product of God's mercy and grace. That's the only way to explain the change in Paul from a, a violent persecutor to a self-sacrificing apostle, from one who hated the name of Jesus Christ to one who loved it and proclaimed it. What a turnabout. What a change that occurred in him. Where grace is active, faith and love will also be present. They are the evidence of grace. They're the evidence of a changed life. And that was what it produced in the Apostle Paul. Now what is true of Paul is true of all who have been saved from beginning to end. Christ found you just as he found Paul, dead in sin and guilt. Verse 15 it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. That states the essence of the gospel. It stresses God's grace and salvation. Christ came to save those in rebellion he took the initiative in saving the guilty, which is to say he took the initiative in saving the undeserving. This is what Jesus said to Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That is grace. And it is so great that it actually does save. <clears throat> Christ didn't come to help sinners save themselves. He doesn't come to give them a little more ability, a little bit of help in that process of being saved. He didn't come to make men savable, as though his work puts them in a position where they can then act if they just will. That's not the way it's presented in the Word of God. That's not the way His atonement is presented. 
He actually saved sinners by his death. He finished the work. He accomplished it. He is the Savior. And his grace is so great that it can reach down and save the worst of sinners. That's what Paul said, that he was the the foremost or the chief of sinners, as the King James Version put it. Now, this isn't morbid self-abasement. It isn't false humility on the part of the apostle, but the, the kind of personal assessment that naturally comes with a a deep and clear understanding of sin and grace. Paul's attempt to destroy the church in its infancy was so grave that it qualified him as the most or the foremost of sinners, either in reality or certainly in his own mind. Knowledge of sin gives an understanding of the greatness of grace and vice versa. As I'm thinking about that, I think of this debate that the medieval theologian Anselm had with an interlocutor, uh, an opponent named uh, Bazo. And at one point, Bazo, who's saying that the, the, the death of Christ is not really necessary to deal with sin, Anselm rebuts that idea by saying, you have not yet considered how great your sin is. And I think that is so true of so much error in theology and in Christian thinking. You haven't considered how great your sin is. Well, the Apostle Paul certainly did. He knew how great his sin is and was. And he, I think, would say, and the more I, the longer I live, the worse it seems to me. So Paul had that true assessment and and gave attention to the depth of his sin in order not, not, not to wallow in his guilt, but in order to highlight the greatness of grace. You'll never understand the greatness of grace until you understand the need for grace. And that's what Paul is, is stating here. He was a great sinner. The greatest, he says. But, but Christ saved him. A self-righteous, Christ-hating killer. That's what Christ saved. And... As Paul states in verse 16, his salvation serves a purpose, which is to show forth God's perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. God is patient. God was patient with Paul. He could have been that warrior of Isaiah 42 and annihilated him in a moment. But he held back his wrath and did it as an example for others, as a model. The word example can mean sketch. It has the idea of being, uh, of, uh, of being what Paul's conversion, it has the idea of saying that Paul's conversion is a, a picture or an illustration of how God deals in grace with all those he saves. He's long-suffering, patient, with them in their rebellion, giving them opportunity. And when he brings them to faith in Christ, they're given eternal life. So Paul's conversion is proof of that. It is proof that as great as a person's sin may be, God's grace is greater. And no one need feel that he is without hope of being saved or so lost that God cannot find him. That encouragement is certainly to be found in Paul's testimony. John Bunyan found it and titled his autobiography, autobiography from this passage, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. But as I said at the beginning, all of this was given principally to encourage Timothy, to rouse him up, to encourage him to do what Paul will tell him to do, fight the good fight. And one way Paul's story does that is that it shows the possibility of success. If God could save Paul, the foremost of sinners, then he can change even those those teachers who were teaching false doctrines or strange doctrines, as Paul says. Besides, Timothy is serving the God of grace and power, who Paul said in verse 12, strengthened him for service. And he would strengthen Timothy 
as he trusted the Lord and walked by faith. That's what he does for all of us. Now that was Paul's purpose in this. It was not a spontaneous digression. What might be spontaneous was what comes next in verse 17, Paul's doxology. You have these in, in Paul's letters periodically. He breaks out in a doxology because he could not help himself. He could not help but marvel over the, the greatness of God, marvel over the grace of God. So we have a doxology here. As he considered the grace that abounded to him, the chief of sinners... He said, now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. In other words, God is holy. God is completely different from his creatures and creation. He's different from us. He's not like us. We are all creatures. He is uncreated. We are creatures of time. He sits above time. He is outside of time. He is the king eternal, Paul says, or king of the ages. He is unaffected by time. He created it. He guides it. So all events of this world, all events of life unfold according to his will and purpose. That should have been an encouragement to Timothy. God is in control of every moment of his life. Nothing happens within those moments that is not within the control of God, the very God he serves. It may not be pleasant experiences, and those are not experiences that God's indifferent to uh, or callous toward. It affects him, certainly. But he is in control and using it all for a good purpose. So we may not see that. That's the assurance that this gives to us, that gives to Timothy. Should have been encouragement to Timothy. Uh, God is in control. And because he rules time and is unaffected by time, he's also immortal. He is incorruptible. He never changes. He cannot perish. So he is an inexhaustible source of strength for us that will never fail us. That was Paul's experience as he described it in verse 14 when he said that grace was poured out to him. It was more than abundant. It superabounded to him. It was like a river that overflowed its banks. Think of the Mississippi River and... Uh, all of that, the water that flows through it, I, I read, I think I read this correctly, that uh, a million and a half gallons of water a day, a day flow through that out of the river. And then think of it when, when it, it floods and overflows its banks and breaks levees. It's powerful. Or better, think of the Nile River. It overflows its banks annually to water the ground and make the land fertile and productive for crops. It, it, it overflows with abundance for a good reason and a helpful reason. So does the grace of God overflow to cause faith and love to grow. God is more dependable than the Nile. He is immutable, never changing, and always faithful to us to supply all our needs. He is invisible. It's not like the idols of men that they can see and touch and, and polish and carry around, but that rust and fall apart and do nothing for anyone. They cannot see, they cannot smell, they cannot speak, they cannot touch, they cannot do anything. They cannot help in time of need. They may be lovely to look at. Most of them are probably terrifying to look at. Uh, they uh, excite some kind of emotion, but they do nothing. God, as Paul will say in chapter 6 and verse 16, is the one who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. And so we cannot comprehend him, not ultimately. He is beyond us. Still, he's revealed himself to us. He's revealed himself as being active, 
and faithful and powerful and sufficient for every need. He has revealed something of himself. He is eternal. We can never fully grasp him. In fact, as you consider this verse, verse 17, think about God and think about what he's revealed of himself. What it tells us is there's no end to the knowledge of God. We'll never come to the end of it in this life. And we will enter eternity and consider him and learn of him forever. No end to it because there's no end to him. There are no bounds to him. Nevertheless, he's revealed something of himself to us in his word and a lot about himself in his eternal son who is the exact representation of his father. He is unfailing in his faithfulness and his love and supply of grace to his people. And we experience it all when we believe him, when we put our faith in him and what he said, when we put him to the test, as it were, by living in obedience, then we see him faithful to us. So what he's doing here is encouraging Timothy, walk by faith, trust him. These thoughts made Paul praise him, praise the Lord with this last statement, to the only God be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. There is no other God but the triune God, the three in one. Paul then turns his attention back to Timothy and resumes the exhortation he began in verse 3 where he gave him this assignment to uh, instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. He describes Timothy's task now in military terms. It's hard, it's a challenge, but first Paul encourages Timothy with a reminder of the signs that had been given to him when he was a young man and, and pointed him to his calling. Verse 18, this command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight. What greater encouragement is there than that, to go forward and fight the good fight. He had supernatural signs that confirmed his fitness for service. And Paul is saying, in effect, don't dismiss that. Don't, don't doubt them. It's very similar, I think, to, to Paul's experience in Antioch in Acts 13 when the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And evidently that happened through some prophets. So they laid hands on the two men, they sent them out. Something like that happened with Timothy when he was younger. He had been given a direct indication from the Lord that he was adequately equipped for the work of the ministry. But we don't have prophets today in the church, we don't have apostles today to appoint officers in the church. But at Antioch, it was the Holy Spirit who spoke. And he still speaks today. He speaks to our hearts inaudibly. But does that in conjunction with Scripture. Never is, it, is his leading inconsistent with Scripture. So it's as we study the Scriptures, know the will of God, that the Spirit of God makes known to us what he would have us do. And the direction and the conviction he gives in leading us into service, along with the, the confirmation given through others who affirm or confirm the Lord's leading, does much the same today as was done in that day, in Paul's day. So Paul reminds Timothy of these supernatural tokens from God that confirmed <clears throat> his calling into service, and he, he recalls this to, to bolster, reinforce his courage. And then Paul tells him to fight the good fight. That's what Timothy was to be doing. That's what we are to be doing. We are in a fight. We are in a battle. It is constant. It never ends. It may seem to have lulls in it. There may be times of peace. But those are dangerous times if we're not aware that we are in a constant conflict. That the task before us is not easy. 
But we are equipped for it, just as Timothy was. The first means of fighting is faith. In, in verse 19, Paul advises Timothy to keep it. Keeping faith and a good conscience. Faith here, at the beginning of this verse, is um, the act of believing, of trusting in the promises of God. That's how we fight the good fight. By trusting in the Lord and all that He's told us to do, we are to do it. It may be difficult, may seem to be beyond our abilities, and it, we can be assured of this, it always is beyond our abilities. Nevertheless, we obey Him, trusting Him. The word faith at the end of the verse, when Paul speaks of some who have suffered shipwreck regarding it, that is Christian doctrine. The two are different. You don't see it so much in the, in the English text here. Uh, the, the Greek text doesn't have their faith. It has the faith. It has the definite article with it, which indicates that this is Christian doctrine. It's literally the faith which certain ones rejected. So Paul is using these military metaphors to bring out the importance of the, uh, the fight that we're in, the life that we are in. And his principal passage, is, um, as you know, is Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20, where he describes the war as invisible and he lists the weapons of our armor, what we use to fight successfully in this spiritual warfare that we are in. He doesn't list all the, the armor and the weapons here. It only mentions faith. Faith as trusting, and then at the end, faith as truth. The act of faith, the act of believing, and then the object of faith, which is Christian doctrine. We need to know the truth the doctrines of the Christian faith, the Word of God, and we need to act on it. And that's the way to wage war against error. The, the church will always be in that battle, always be in a, a battle about truth and error. And we will be in that battle until Christ returns. And so we must know the truth to fight the error that is all around us and is always going to be there and know the truth so that we can protect ourselves from it and from its influence. Those who don't, those who reject the Word of God, reject the teaching of the apostles and the prophets, depart from it, depart from Scripture, shipwreck their lives, Paul says. By rejecting God's Word, they reject the rudder of the ship. They throw away their spiritual and moral compass. And so to effectively contend for the faith, we must be good soldiers and good sailors. We must be able to fight and navigate with knowledge and wisdom. That is the good fight. What we do, and this is for every one of us, what we do as Christians is important. It matters. And so we must know the Word of God to know what to do. In verse 20, Paul identifies those who were probably the ringleaders of the group that was teaching the law falsely. They are Hymenaeus and Alexander. And Paul writes that he had handed them over to Satan so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. This was an act of church discipline. We find this same expression in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5, where a young man was engaged in immorality. A young man in the church was engaged in immorality, and the church had done nothing. They tolerated it, looked the other way, didn't seem particularly troubled by it. So Paul writes that he delivered such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Satan has authority within God's will to destroy physically. And we see that in the book of Job. In Job, God had a good purpose for what happened. But he used Satan in that. 
And so too here, the, the discipline was remedial. Paul was rescuing the shipwreck. He wasn't throwing them overboard. He was teaching them not to blaspheme. Church discipline is another weapon in the fight or defense of the faith, and it is used to keep the church pure, keep it from moral corruption and spiritual error, keep it from false teaching. Paul hoped that by being separated from God's people and buffeted by Satan, these men would repent and be restored to fellowship. Still, it was a serious act on his part um, and would be, have serious consequences for those men. But it was necessary to stop false teaching. If we don't act against error, error will take root and destroy a local church. Paul had begun the uprooting and told Timothy to carry on the work. We all need to be active in the good fight. And grace should motivate us to do that as it did Paul. He never forgot that grace abounded to him the chief of sinners. That gave him incentive to live the Christian life. He said that in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14 that the love of Christ, meaning the love Christ had for him, Christ's love for him, the knowledge of that controlled him constrained him to serve gladly. There are many motivations in the Christian life, many legitimate motivations, the, the hard consequences of faithlessness. That's illustrated here with these two men, Alexander and Hymenaeus. There's that, that negative sense of motivation. Uh, then there's the, the glorious rewards that faith fullness will, will give. That's a great motivation. But the greatest motivation is Christ's love for us. Over a century and a half ago, Thomas Chalmers preached a sermon to his congregation in Glasgow. The title of it says everything. You can read the sermon and basically you've got the whole sermon in the title. The expulsive power of a new affection. That new affection is grace in Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. And it is powerful. It, it is expulsive. It pushes out all other affections. As we focus on him, as we learn of him, as we understand the grace of God, we want to do things for him. We don't have to preach to ourselves not to do things, and we do have to do that, but... This love of God constrains us not to do the, the uh, kind of indifferent, unimportant things of life and put ourselves on the right path and do the right things. It pushes out all other affections. That's what Chalmers is saying. And I think that's what Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians. The, the greater the love within us for him and then for his people, the greater the power. It's what led the sinful woman into Simon the Pharisee's house, where in spite of Simon's disdain for him, for her, couldn't imagine that Jesus would allow this woman to show attention to him. She's a sinful woman. In spite of Simon's disdain, she entered the house, she anointed Jesus with perfume and washed his dusty feet with her tears. Luke chapter 7. Why'd she do that? Because she loved much. Why did she love much? Because she was forgiven much, and she knew it. She had the expulsive power of a new affection, so she denied self for him. That is what Paul was encouraging in Timothy by telling his story, because it was Timothy's story, and it's your story, it's my story. He saved us, of all people, out of sin, much sin, and dreadful death. He saved us from that. Don't, don't think that you are just kind of a sinner. Well, you're far more than that. You are a real sinner. 
And the more you know about yourself and the extent of your rebellion, you may conclude that you too are a chief of sinners. But Christ wiped the slate clean of all the charges, erased them all by his own blood. Does that make you want to lounge now? Does that make you want to to drift a bit? Or does that make you, in the short time that you have, want to live for him and fight the good fight? I think as you consider all that he's done for you, you will want to serve him. It will move you to live a life that brings great honor and glory to him. And you will have that sense, that understanding as you see him in Scripture. And the more you see him, the more the glory you see, and the more you love of the, of the love and grace of God you will see, and the more you will love him, and the more that expulsive power will move you to live for him. Warriors have roused themselves to fight with battle cries like, remember the Alamo. But we have one. Remember Calvary. That's where we find incentive to fight the good fight. May the Holy Spirit help all of us to think deeply on the free and sovereign grace of God in Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. There is nothing more purifying and encouraging than that. And may he help some of you who may not have believed in our Lord to know that you are a sinner that may be offensive but it's true, you are a sinner, you are guilty, you need a Savior who can wash you clean. Look to Christ, the only Savior, trust in Him. He receives all who do. And then live for His glory. Let's stand and sing number, hymn, hymn number 35 in the white book, O Church Arise, and then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number 35. Father, we do look forward to that day when we will stand with Christ in glory. And when that day comes, may we stand with Him as men and women who lived a faithful life with the short time You've given us to live it. So may we fix our eyes on Your Son, on the Lord Jesus Christ, and run that race and fight the battle in a way that pleases You, is honoring to You and Your Word. May we be men and women who trust You, who live by faith, and see your hand of supply and sufficiency and grace and mercy to us. We pray these things in Christ's name.